mumps in the National Hockey League, measles in Disneyland, and now in Ontario's capital city. We've seen viruses once declared under control or even eliminated spreading in certain areas in North America. And joining us now to explain how this happened, here's Natasha Crowcroft. She is Chief of Infectious Diseases at Public Health Ontario. Welcome back to the agenda. Thank you. It's nice to see you again. Okay, if we were under the impression that these viruses had been, if not eradicated, at least eliminated mm -hmm. from our daily lives, why are they back? Well, they've not eradicated from the whole world. So we know that outside Canada, the virus is still there. It's there in Africa, it's there in East Asia, in South Asia. So um, in this global world, everybody's going everywhere all the time. So this, in particular, measles will show up. Um, and so we expect cases to occur every now and then, to come into the country every now and then. Um, getting four cases that are unconnected in, in one week is pretty unusual, though. That is pretty unusual, isn't yeah. it? I mean, when, would the, when would be the last time that happened? Um, we had about, I think, 22 cases of measles in Ontario last year, and they didn't, they weren't, there wasn't a group of four like this, so I'm not hmm. aware that this has happened before. Do, um, do, can, can you tell us how, we're going to get into this vaccine business here, mm -hmm. how do vaccines work in individuals? So um, what they try and do is mimic what happens when you get the real infection without giving you the disease itself. So they try and make your immune system, trick your immune system into responding in exactly the same way it would if you had measles, but you don't get all the, the complications of measles. Um, so you make the same kinds of antibodies. With the measles virus, um, with a vaccine, it's a live vaccine, so it is like a mini infection. Um, with other vaccines, it's, a, it's bits of the, um, it's like a subunit of the actual um, organism and it, it makes you make antibodies but you don't have a, a little infection so there's two different ways but the mm. the end results the same you get you get the protection without the disease so the gist of it is sort of a f to fool your body into thinking you're getting the flu let's take the flu you get a mm -hmm. flu shot we're fooling your body into thinking you're getting the flu it's not really getting the flu but your antibodies are going to kick in and yeah. fight off that virus anyway yeah so and you won't get pneumonia you won't get you know, brain infection you won't get all the horrible things you just get the antibodies okay now talk to us about the herd immunity what does that refer to so that's the other really important piece of how vaccines work so they work in individuals as you were alluding to and then they work in in whole communities and they do that by everyone being um, everyone being protected means the virus has got nowhere to go so if somebody does show up in Ontario as we expect um, and it happens from time to time um, they, you know, they come into the airport, they'll walk past people and they'll be shedding virus if they're sick all around them. But if everyone around them is immunized, it's not going to go anywhere. It won't get past this sort of barrier of, of the herd. But if one person's not? If one person's not and then they meet someone else who isn't and then someone else who isn't, and that's how it spreads and that's how, that, that's how you have this breakdown in the herd immunity. Thus it is important for society as a whole that everybody gets immunized so that nobody is that sort of weak link in the chain, is that the idea? Absolutely, um, for everyone. Um, and it's especially for the, the kids who are too young to be immunized or kids who've um, got some problem like leukemia who can't be immunized, they can't be given a live vaccine. They have to be protected by, by everyone else. And, um, you know, and most people get that idea. If you, if you ask them, well, um, you know, if you say to someone, could you get yourself immunized to protect other people? Some people's reaction is, oh, why would I get protected? You know, why would I get immunized to protect mm -hmm. someone else? But when it gets into specifics, um, for example, there was a school in the East End of London where I used to work, uh, not at the school, but I used to work in London, um, where there was a kid with leukemia and he was coming back to school for the first time and it was a Catholic school. And so the principal of the school wrote to all the parents and said, look, you know, this guy's coming back to school for the first time. He's had leukemia. We can't immunize him, but there's lots of measles around. Please, could you get your kids immunized? And when that kid came back to school, every single child in the school was immunized. So because that worked. It, wor it works when it's like um, someone you know, it's your community. You realize like no one would put another child knowingly at risk when they, when they know. It's that sort of theoretical idea that I'm being immunized for someone else's benefit. And I think that misrepresents herd immunity. Um, you know, some people think of it, herd immunity in that way. It's like, oh, I'm doing good for society. But actually, you're doing good for real people, people you know, um, children of, fr of friends, um, older people. It's, it's, much more, uh, it's much more personal mm. than that. Having said that, getting vaccinated does not 100% mean you won't get the virus, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Nothing in life is 100%. We set a very high bar. I mean, if you get 
95% in an exam at school, you're doing well. Um, most of our vaccines are 95 plus effective. So we, you know, we set a high bar, they work very well. And for most vaccines, even if you get the infection when you're vaccinated, you usually get a mild aversion. So it, it's not a, you know, it's a win-win situation really. We joke here because I get my flu shot every year mm -hmm. and I'm going to bust you now, Tina. Tina Zavagno, who's doing audio today, never okay. gets a flu shot. Okay. I get the flu just about every year and she never does. <laughs> I'm being a good citizen and she's not and yet she gets off scot-free. Can you explain to me the justice in that? There is no justice in that. <laughs> <laughs> so why do I bother getting my flu shot and she never does? Well, for one, one Besides thing Besides the is fact that she's bad and evil. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't comment on anybody being bad or evil, but uh, I think um, so for one thing, most people uh, who think they get flu every year don't get flu every year. They get other things. There's a whole load of other viruses that cause things that look just like flu. Um, the head of the flu lab in the UK one year got flu from her son. She was convinced it was flu. and She was a flu expert, you know. She d decided to test herself and her son and it wasn't flu. What was it? It was something called RSV, a, a resp respiratory syncytial virus, which is a, another virus that's around every winter, usually affects kids, but can affect adults as well. Natasha, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, I don't know. <laughs> it's, sure not felt, it's not necessarily a duck. It's not necessarily a duck? <laughs> okay, so you say. Now getting back to that idea of the herd immunity mentality and so on, what percentage of people need to get a childhood vaccine mm -hmm mumps, measles, rubella, in order to eradicate a disease? Oh, again, so, I shouldn't have said eradicate, No, eradicate's I? fine. Yeah? We, what we want to do is eradicate diseases from the world. Okay. There's only one disease we've done that for, and that's smallpox, but we'd like to eradicate measles. We're closest on polio to eradicating polio. And the distinction um, between eradicating and eliminating is what? So it's, it's kind of jargon, but elimination we use to refer to when you get rid of a, uh, the ongoing spread of a disease within a particular region. So in the Americas, which is North, Central, South America, that whole area, that whole region, um, has no um, transmission of, ongoing transmission of measles or polio. But there's still polio spreading in other parts of the world. So we don't call it eradicated yet. until we call we've, it eliminated we've, in the Western Hemisphere. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so back to that other question. What percentage of people do you need to get vaccinated to eradicate a disease? So for, um, it, it varies for, from one disease to another. It's highest for measles because that's the most infectious disease we know of. Um, we need about 97% of the, of the population to be immune. Uh, now, is that 90%, 97% of, of Ottawa or of Ontario <laughs> or of Canada or what? Of the world. Of the world? Yes. That's impossible. Uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. And well, it'll take us some time. It's a high bar. It's a high to bar. To use your expression. It's a high bar. Yeah. Is, is that doable? Um, there was actually a meeting about this that the World Health Organization hosted about whether or not it was feasible. Um, for measles particularly, because that's a really hard one to do. And, and the conclusion was that we, it should be achievable. If we had um, even better vaccines, because the vaccines are pretty good, if we had even better ones, it might make it easier. Um, but, you know, measles is a really hard one. Polio, you don't need so high. Uh, smallpox, we only needed about 60%. So that's one of the reasons smallpox was the first, because we didn't need to have such high coverage. Silly question here, but why would you not need 100% coverage if you were going to 100% eradicate a disease? Mm -hmm. um, well, it goes back to what we were saying about herd immunity. If you achieve herd immunity, then the virus has nowhere to go. So if, if on average, each person infects less than one other person, it becomes extinct. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like the dodo. It's a very similar kind of uh, scientific idea. It, you know, if there aren't enough around, then it can't, pro it can't propagate. So okay. it just so fizzles out. If it's 97% for measles, mm -hmm. what would you need for the flu? For the flu, it's much more complex. Uh, the reason for that is we haven't got a vaccine that we can give once to everyone and gives people immunity forever. You've got to get it every year. The, and, and the virus is in animals. So as soon as a mm. virus is living in another reservoir, like animals, like, but in this case, it's mainly birds, then um, it's going to be very hard, a real challenge. We could control the infection, especially if we got better vaccines in people, and, and, and we do save a lot of lives through flu vaccine, um, but we could do better. I don't, I know, don't take away from that, but um, we're not going to be able to eradicate flu. That's just not going to hmm. be possible. Do you have any idea where we are today in the province of Ontario when it comes to MMR virus uh, versus the flu? What kind of coverage we're getting? 
Um, so from, our, um, from the data we have from schools, we're looking at um, probably around about 95% coverage. It's a little bit difficult to say, and it depends on the age group. Um, and so we look at kids when they go to school at the age of seven and then, um, and then at 17. Um, and so it's probably about 95% for measles, mumps, and rubella, although the, the data is not that good. Uh, for influenza, we really don't know right now where we are. Because it's voluntary? It, it varies. It's voluntary. Um, it's given through lots of different routes. So, you know, you can go and get it at the pharmacy, which is great. I think the highest uptake we ever had was about 42%. Um, it was higher in older people and people who have um, medical problems. Mm. Um, but we've never reached anything like 90% in Ontario or 42. anywhere in the world, as far as I'm aware. Is 42% any good? Is it going to um, do anything for you? It, it, it's not going to do much in terms of herd immunity um, it's better than I mean it's better than nothing better than nothing yeah are there people for whom you would recommend they not get a vaccine very very few very few yeah people who've got problems with their immune systems are, are told not to get live vaccines because we don't know what's going to happen to them mm. um, you know their immune systems may not be strong enough to make make a good response um, but really very few it's hardly any most, most of the uh, ideas of who can't get vaccines, they're usually myths that have just come through the ages. You know, if you've, your great aunt had epilepsy, you shouldn't have a vaccine. They're, they're just all been debunked. That's not true either. It's not true either. No. Well, here's another one. You know, every time this story comes forward, you hear more things from more parents on a whole range of issues. And there was an article on a vaccine hesitant person uh, in the Ottawa Citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, a mother quoted as saying, I feel like our risk factors are low. We are not in the city a lot. We are healthy. We eat whole foods. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we don't need vaccination. Mm -hmm. Any truth to that? Um, well, it's great that they're healthy, but you can't hide from these viruses. As we've seen in Toronto, you can, you can live in a city like Ottawa and never leave it and not knowingly be in contact with someone who has traveled and still get measles very easily. Uh, measles is so infectious that if you go into a room that somebody left an hour or two before who had measles and you just go into that room, you can get measles. It, it just hangs infectious. in the air. So, you know, people often get infected without having any idea how. So there's no hiding from measles. I once called it the Terminator virus because it's, it's like it will find you. It'll <laughs> track you down if you're not immunized. So It'll be back. It'll be back. Yes, yes gotcha. <laughs> Is it possible for somebody to be so low risk to the point where they don't need to get it? Maybe not this person in Ottawa who lives, you know, admittedly in a city, but you know, if you live somewhere, let's say in, in a remote part of Northern Ontario, would, would it be legit, legitimate not to get it? If you, if you never saw anyone your entire life, maybe, but like who lives like that? It's an unrealistic scenario. And we don't know who's gonna get complications. Um, Roald Dahl's daughter died of measles. I don't know if you know, it, it, it's not a commonly known story. So Roald Dahl, who wrote um, the Charlie BFD, the Chocolate, Charlie Factory. Chocolate Factory, yeah, he, he had a daughter who died when she was six from measles. He, she got measles encephalitis. Mm. So she seemed to be recovering and then she got this brain infection and died. She was a perfectly healthy little girl. And um, he wrote a letter to everyone saying, get your children vaccinated. She had that. not been. Um, it was in the days, I mean, this was some generations yeah. before, it was before measles vaccine was readily available. So when, um, when they started promoting the vaccine, he wrote a letter about it saying, go out there and get your kids vaccinated because it doesn't matter how healthy your child is. Mm -hmm. Measles doesn't care. It's not going to pick, you know, we don't know who, who's going to have the complications. We have no idea. Should people who live in Toronto be concerned about the fact there are four new cases in the city? If their children are not vaccinated and they're not vaccinated, they should get out, go out there and get vaccinated. That, they should be concerned if they're not vaccinated. Otherwise, if you've had two doses of vaccine, I wouldn't worry. You got kids? I have kids. Did they get vaccinated? Well, it's interesting you should say that. Following what your, your discussion with Brendan about um, vaccine hesitancy, um, when I was working in the UK during the MMR and autism scare, I gave loads and loads of presentations to, to nurses and doctors about MMR and autism and how there was not a link. And it, was, it goes back to this idea that information is not what people want to hear and not what people need. So I'd, I'd speak for an, you know, half an hour to a room full of people about MMR and autism. And every single presentation, people would come up to me afterwards and would say to me, thanks very much, that was really interesting. But um, I've got a child who's coming up for their vaccines and they're due their MMR, should they have it? And do you have children and are they vaccinated? And um, 
And I would be able to say, yes, absolutely, my children had absolutely all the vaccines they should have. They've had, they both had their MMR. Um, and I would say, you know, please go and get your kids vaccinated. And they wanted me to tell them that. They wanted me to say to them, go and get your child vaccinated. Um, they, they'd heard all the scientific evidence. So this is healthcare professionals. They heard all the scientific evidence, and but yet, it wasn't touching them. It's not what they, they needed, needed to know. They still needed to hear it from somebody. They, they wanted to know, yeah, exactly. So that's why I'm, it's kind of a roundabout way of saying to you, yes, of course, <laughs> yes. I wouldn't stand up and tell people to get vaccinated if I you know, didn't believe in it and didn't have my own kids vaccinated. Flu um, shot too? And flu shot too, absolutely. We have elderly family, we have friends with cancer. We, you know, we, I couldn't live with myself if, even if the vaccine's 30% effective, if I reduce my risk of giving someone else the flu by a third, by a half, I, you know, I'm for a, a quick shot in the arm, absolutely, I, every year. Natasha, it's good of you to come into TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.